The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The next, the next three classes deal with a discussion of three models which we developed in this class with Kevin Lynch and I have subsequently changed and added to. The three models are not unique. They are examples of models which inform the form of a city have instructions as to who should take part, have premises of materialism or theism associated with them. Um, I'll go through the first one today, the co what we call the cosmic model. And uh, you can see that the definitions of Stasis, objective, control, science, nature, type, and form tools will be what we will discuss in this class. The most common theory associated with the beginning of cities has a materialist basis. This is, of course, wrong. The materialist basis is based on the notion that a surplus is produced through agriculture, and a surplus requires a system of bureaucracy, a literature, or literally elite, um, uh, a method for controlling irrigation systems, and so on and the primitive notions of trade. Why don't I just read you a standard explanation of surplus? Because you should remember the word. It's an important word in the theory of city form, the notion of the production of more than you need. It involves storage, it involves the world of, that's why I regard the invention of the potter's wheel is one of the more significant inventions of humankind. Uh, how do you store food? If, how do you have, what do you do with the surplus of food unless you have commodities or containers that can separate the food from the corrosion forces of nature? The surplus. Surplus production beyond the immediate needs of the community made possible the emancipation of some people from the toils of the land. Here's an interesting f observation. That if you produce excess, you relieve certain people of conventional duties. We have excess which relieves a man to become the conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. It's only when you have a surplus which, which is not taken into account in much of our modern economics. But this created the opportunity for specialized tasks and groups associated with them, namely scribes, craftsmen, priests, warriors. Com surplus production presumes irrigation, and efficient irrigation system presumes a complex bureaucracy and that means cities. This theory, materialist theory, is best written about in Gideon Schoberg's book, The Pre-Industrial City, S-J-O-B-E-R-G, and in Gordon Child, an Australian writer who wrote a book called Man Makes Himself. These are classic depictions of surplus theory. 
there's a version of surplus subdivision of surplus theory into two kinds. One held by Jane Jacobs in her book, The Economy of Cities, which argues that in the town of Ksatalhuyuk, C-A-T-A-L-H-U-Y-U-K, was a center for industrial production of obsidian, and agricultural served as it does conventionally in our societies as the, product, as the source of production for industrial commodities such as obsidian. This is different from the agricultural surplus, which regards agriculture as the primary function and pays no attention to material production. The most, the most students of the origin of cities now don't believe in either of these two propositions, so forget them. They're not important. The common version of this new theory suggests that original cities were ceremonial centers, places of holy ritual, which explained the risky forces of nature and secured them for human benefit. Peasants supported them voluntarily, attracted by their holy power. Thus arose a permanent priestly class, awesome and seductive. Only later did the marks of urban civilization appear, war, trade, writing, extensive craft specialization, and so on so that the first cities were mental weapons, not physical forces. Now, let's look at some of this a bit more carefully. Joseph Rickford, in writing about, in a book called The Idea of a Town, writing about the definition of Roman cities. The Romans are considered to be the prime rationalists of, of, of ancient times, uh, and their towns are often seen as rational outcomes of surveying technique and military pr uh, fortification. I quote Rickford, he says, the town is not really a natural phenomenon. He is setting up a distinction between the desire, the form of the town and nature. We'll get into the fallacies of biomorphosis and so on as we go through this class. You will understand that I'm not a naturalist. Uh, I understand that everything that happens around us is processed by the amount of material, the 1,250 cubic centimeters in the human brain. It's interesting in talking about the cosmic model to notice the definition of informal religion of the idea of heaven. Heaven is only a concept of humankind. In the, we'll touch on that a bit later. Um, Lewis Mumford, I'm just choosing just little s bits from these sources. The original aspects of temporary settlements have to do with sacred things, not just with the physical environment. They relate to a more valuable and p meaningful kind of life with a consciousness, consciousness that entertains past and future, apprehends the primal mysteries of sexual generation and the ultimate mystery of death and what may lie beyond death. These central concerns abide as the very reason for the city's existence, inseparable from the economic substance that makes it possible. Another item from <coughs> Mumford, talking about the height, exaggerated height and thickness of walls in the earlier cities. Seventy, the wall of Khorsabad, which is a Syrian town, the fourth capital city of 
the Kingdom of Assyria, built around 700 BC. The walls are 75 feet thick. There's no possibility that you build 75 feet thick walls for military purposes. In Mumford's term, it is only for the gods that men exert themselves so extravagantly. It's a wonderful phrase. Remember it. Never forget it. It's only for the gods that men, if you wish to enlarge the notion of gods, and I'll discuss the notion of a god gene uh, a bit later, what we do is not only based on simple postulates of function. It's central to architectural <coughs> as a discipline that it's only for gods that, you ma that man exerts themselves so extensively. Quoting from another source, every feature of the early city con reveals the belief that man was created for no other purpose than to magnify and serve his gods. That was the city's ultimate for reason, reason for being. Now here you have two postulates. You have to survive. You at the birth of an, an instrument, a city, which both has to deal with so your survival possibility. You look to the stars. The stars are permanent. It's not very difficult to erect a vertical mm, stick, a gnomon, in Mesopotamia. And the, at noon, the stick will cast a shadow to the north. You'll be able to build a compass around that. At the same time as doing that, you will wonder why the town of Chang'an in 190 BC in China is built according to the stars of the Dipper. I'll show you a slide of that plan. It's one of the remarkable plans. So the stability and of astronomy in the earliest cycles of cities and the creation of a deity significance in relation to each of these acts. It's one thing to know where north is. It's another thing to build your city according to the primary objectives of religion. We'll go on a little about picking up little aspects of this. Most of the significant buildings built in archaic times involve enormous amounts of human labor. For the pyramid of chops, which has nothing to do with function whatsoever, it has nothing to do with materialism. It is, in fact, such an exhaustion of materialism. Uh, it took, the pyramid of chops took 100,000 men, 20 years to build. The Great Pyramid of Chops was built with about 2,300,000 blocks of stone, totaling about 6 million tons in weight. The blocks average 2.5 tons, but range up to 15 tons, which have to be quarried, handled, and transported up a river lifted 100 feet to the level of the site with sledges, rollers, sleepers, ropes, and levers. You don't do that for anything other than the belief in the post-eternal, post-secular uh, life. Egypt didn't produce any large cities for various reasons, which we'll talk about later in this class. But Many argue that they much of the disposition of, of resources uh, consequently centered on the building of post-contemporary life. 
Um, the most significant buildings in most of these early cities are religious buildings. They're generally built out of com compression structures. Solomon's Temple, uh, about 1000 BC in Jerusalem. Herod's Temple, 70 years before the death, birth of Christ. Both enormous compression structures. Associated with these compression structures, which generally can't go up to more than two to three hundred feet in height, the temples of Chichen Itza in Mesoamerica are about two hundred feet. The Tower of Babel is about two hundred feet in height. The Tower of Babel has the Temple of Marduk on the top of the Tower of Babel. All of this is synchronous with the fact that religion was interpreted not by every person, but by gurus, by priests, people who achieved enormous power, but didn't distribute the secrets of their power. The Holy of Holies in Solomon's Temple is still being sought for by uh, filmmakers and people who want to excavate under the Holy Mount in Jerusalem. Of course, uh, something which is prohibited by political uh, forces. Um, the origin of the mosque, the church, and the synagogue is later, in my view. The democracy of religion, which we all now uh, utilize, I think comes in a different pattern. The first action that I think in this direction comes from the Jewish exile in 700 BC. The Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army destroys the first Solomon's temple. He takes the Jews in exile <coughs> to Babylon. Babylon is the greatest city in the world at the time. The Jews don't abandon their religion despite the fact that they don't have a temple and they don't have uh, priests. They start praying in schools, in homes. Ezekiel appears as, in, as part of it. Ezekiel, how many chapters of Ezekiel are in the beginning of the Old Testament? A whole bunch of them. What are they about? They're all about measurements of a temple. These measurements have been interpreted in all kinds of ways over time. The fact is that when the Jews were released from Babylon in exile, they returned to Jerusalem and Ezra read the Bible to the people for the first time. Later on, I think one of the conflicts about Jesus in my view, and I will go into this in more detail in the story of Jerusalem. Uh, is the fact that the synagogue and the democratic religion was growing in power under the Pharisees and that Herod's uh, temple was the, the last resort of the power of the priests. And Jesus was a confrontation to the priests, to the Jewish priests who were on the, out, were on the way out and his death was a mark of the transition in Christianity from, well, the birth of Christianity to the church and later on, 700 years later, to the mosque. So we have an image of the pre-democratic church environment as buildings of compression, no penetration of the building by the people, the slaughtering of animals, Solomon's temple, I think 200,000 animals were slaughtered, or 20,000, it doesn't matter, it's just, just a number. The giving of a gift at the birth of a, of a ritual is also part of that same phenomenon. Many of these priestly directions still occur in some ways in contemporary religion. Anyway, 
So we have an image here of a set town as a pristine object with, which changes very regularly and under control. It doesn't change sporadically. It stays the same. Population growth is very low. Death is, rates are high. Population rate, growth rates in medieval Europe due to disease were something like 0.6% per annum. So the idea that things change very radically and very rapidly is a very contemporary idea. You could build a city in which everything roughly was the same. And the routines for understanding it and managing it are also more or less the same. This kind of city is a mental force in itself. It accumulates the understanding of it, its perpetuated through rituals. Rituals, according to Mercia Eliade, E-L-I-D-E, -E, the Romanian religious philosopher, whom I will quote for in a few minutes, um, there's a distinct, oh, let's wait until we get there. Human life is given is thereby given a secure and permanent place. The gods are upheld, chaos is kept off, and not incidentally the structure of human power of priests and kings and the abilities always is also maintained. Let's just listen to Eliade's depiction of archaic man. If we observe the general behavior of archaic man, we are struck by the following fact. Neither the objects of the external world nor human acts, properly speaking, have any autonomous intrinsic value. Objects or acts acquire their significance and become real because they re-enact after one fashion or another a reality that transcends them. This is difficult stuff to understand. Amongst countless stones, one stone becomes sacred and hence instantly becomes saturated with being. It becomes a reality as opposed to an everyday reality. It constitutes a hierophany, H-I-E-R-O-P-H-N-E-Y, because it commemorates a mythical act and so on. The object appears as the receptacle of an external force to differentiate it from the crude product of nature, the object fashioned by the industry of man, acquire the reality, the identity, only to the extent of their participation in a transcendent reality. In relation to the form of cities, Eliade talks about three things. Reality is a function of the imitation of a celestial archetype, I've mentioned before. Number two, the symbolism of the center. The, why a center? The word Babylon means the conjunction of the heaven and the earth and the subterranean. Jerusalem <coughs> is known for its being a city on the ground. In Christ Christianic terms, there's a city 15 miles above. Raphael paints uh, a wonderful picture of the earthly city and the city. Pope, <coughs> Pope Urban II in 1080, in talking to the Crusades, in Europe before they set off for Jerusalem, talks to them about taking the earthly city and the heavenly city. The invention of heaven is a human invention. The Hebrews, <coughs> the Jews didn't in early accept the idea of uh, uh, the life beyond the normal daily experience of life. The center 
is not only the position of maximum concentration, it is the position of maximum identification. <coughs> it's described in many of these terms in cosmic terms, not only as a functional economic center, but as the central place which distinguishes itself from other place. In Eliade's terms, there's a difference between the sacred and the profane. The profane is the everyday world. Reverse it, our secular world is not in our terms profane. But in our gay times, he argues, the secular world is profane, the religious world, the only world purposely created through hierophany of significance. Eliade argues that the third impact on the form of towns were rituals, so significant gestures that require meaning attributed to them. I, will have, I might not have time to go into these examples in China, India, and Mesoamerica, but in the town of Madurai in southern India, I will show you a slide of the rituals still practiced today of each cycle of time as time passes. According to the other, progress was not seen in terms of time by archaic man. Time was not linear, time was circular. There's no notion about the past. The present, <coughs> the existence of important things is, is very much uh, in association with the security that you give to everything. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to go through, skip some of this stuff and try to concentrate on a few of the items. Um, what I'd like to do is, in relation, oh, I didn't tell you what I handed out to you. I'm sorry. This is, a, this is a, an image of a town. Where is it? It's a rather famous city. It's a classical city. It's Athens. The image shows Athens as being built largely around a, 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 an elevated system of space called the Acropolis, a religion, a religious god. And its extension to the water around the, the town of Piraeus, the harbor of Piraeus, depicts the implication of it, of building a town whose form is much more mechanical and much more of the kind that we will talk about next Tuesday. So you have two forms of the same, same system. One dedicated, they know Piraeus is purely a term, uh, a place, <coughs> in conjunction with an expanded view of the Mediterranean, the Acropolis of Athens plus the monuments of gods all over Athens, uh, depicts a consciousness of what we might call the religious gene. The religious gene is a term taken from archaeology relatively recently and based on excavations in, in, in the Mayan world, which uh, argues that belonging to religion was a very, very early phenomenon, largely because of the security the community gave. Belonging to the same thing provided fundamental security and the God gene 
in the Darwinian sense, is built into all of us. Those of us who don't believe in God uh, are not part of the Darwinian pattern. We are creatures of obstinance. Um, and since the Enlightenment have been free to criticize whatever we want to based on fact or on mythology. I'm going to go through the components of a theory on the second page. Yes. Uh, regarding the layout of having both African and at the same time, yeah. Um, was there any sort of social division between them? And if, and if so, what were the different types of social groups that lived in one versus the other? Athens, during the 5th century, and only for one century, experimented with democracy. At that time, all citizens were considered equal, except for women or slaves. Everybody, there's a machine in the museum in Athens, which is almost like a machine in which you put in your fingerprint and it registers you for voting. Uh, so, in democratic Athens, uh, as Socrates would explain, uh, all people were considered equal in the first notion of a crude democracy, which didn't last very long. Athens is situated in rocky country, very poor agriculture, so it's depended on other sources of basic supply of food, such as wheat. Uh, in later years, it was so desperate that it tried to it attacked Sicily, which has always been a center of wheat production. Um, so Piraeus was part of the extension of Athens for food. It was purely a, it was purely a machine-like enterprise. It only had to produce goods for the service of the democratic capital, which was experimenting with all kinds of ways of life, including the purposeful application of democracy. Within Athens, democratic Athens itself, yes, there were areas where the more powerful lived and there were areas where the less powerful. Socrates himself used to walk through Athens on a daily basis. It was small enough to do that. And he would go through different neighborhoods according to his own descriptions. Socrates never wrote, of course, so it's all de told by Plato and other, other people. But that's a short answer um, to a long question. Uh, the history of, of Athens uh, uh, is an interesting story in itself. And I hope we'll have some chance in this class to deal with it. I'm not sure that I'm going to, but we'll try. Um, the other sheet is a plan of Angkor Wat, the 14th, 13th, 14th century city in Cambodia, which I want to use as an illustration of the conjunction between built form associated with religion and built form also at the same time serving practical purposes. The Feng Shui in China faces houses to the south. You are the lady who knows more about China than I do. Again, Ye is a mystical system of this for the selection of the site, for the location of buildings, which, to, which could have practically, purpose speaking, faces in the right direction. Feng Shu would be hopeless if it faced houses towards the north in a climate in the northern hemisphere. The same with my description of the struct, Hindu structure of Angkor, of Angkor Wat. Let's look at some of these components of a theory.
<coughs> First of all, the notion of returning. If there is this discrimination in places, in, in, in places which have been struck by hierophany and therefore are more significant, there would be relatively few of them. And you would, some would be given particular mythological significance and the idea of retaining would be significant. Mumford says the magne, in the history of cities, the magnet comes before the container. It's an interesting sentence to remember. Movement towards cities called urbanization in contemporary t times is a reenactment of a ritual of movement to special places. In our case, is now to secular capital cities, or industrial cities, or economic cities. I will show you a slide of Olympia in Greece, the birth of the Olympic Games, held every four years from 776 BC, a place to which you returned only four years. The contemporary Olympic Games has also maintained the cycle of returning to a place every four years. Hitler wanted to re the Olympic Games after 36 to be in Berlin forever. In fact, he and Speer designed a stadium which was so large that the Olympic rules would have had to be changed to fit the stadium. But that was Hitler's prominence. Hitler also invented the idea of carrying the Olympic flame, which now becomes a popular economic, popular piece of the Olympic Games. The 776 Olympia site was a religious site which priests walked around. Hitler, in trying to manifest the assumption of the meritocracy of the Aryan race, made special attempts to link Germany under Hitler with Greece, with the Athenian culture. Uh, a lot of archaeology was sponsored by German uh, researchers. Hitler wished to combine the permanence and the predominance of the Aryan race, so he took the idea of taking the flame from 776, the site of 776 BC, and taking it to that point, point of the earth where the games would be held that four years. There's no other significance to the carrying of the flame. There was no flame carried in the original Olympic Games. It's only a creation of a manic manifestation of racial supremacy. But there are places in the world which still venerate the idea of pilgrimage, which is a fundamental, still a fundamental source in Islam for returning to uh, Mecca each year. Uh, the places like Benares and Fatima in Portugal, places have been sanctified in some way or other. Uh, Pilgrimage, I'll deal with pilgrimage in another class. Pilgrimage is a very interesting function of lateral movement between cities prior to the economic significance of economic trade. Natural phenomena, number two. And Corvette had a population of some people argue as large as a million people in the 14th century. I don't believe it, but there's no way of knowing. Its significance in size was based on the fact that it, uh, it had enough water to produce more than one crop of rice per year. Sometimes with three, you could, with, with, with that amount of water, you could 
produce three crops of rice per year, therefore feed an enormous population. The plan of Angkor has two large water systems, two are called Barray, B-A-R-A-Y. The West Barray is about seven kilometers in length, the East Barray about five. These are large bodies of water. They are precisely enclosed. The deviation of the rectangular geometry is something like 0.01% error. They are perfectly constructed water bodies. Between the water are towers. In religious terms, in Hindu terms, the towers stand for the peaks of Mount Meru, between which are seven oceans and six continents, with Meru in the center. The lakes are the depictions of oceans. When I visited Angkor for the first time, my guide said to me that there was no water outlet from these two Barai water systems to an external water source. There's a large 87 kilometer lake a number of kilometers away from Angkor, but he <coughs> says these are religious items, these water bodies, but they have no practical significance. Recent archaeology has established that there's a big water supply system from Angkor to Lake Tonsap, I think it is. So here you have the ambivalence, the city in creating an ambivalence of, 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 of symbolism. It works symbolically and works also works practically. Whoever you are, you can associate the significance with symbolism. It's a kind of curious democracy that you can choose which system you want to believe for the genuine authority for your town. We give everybody the chance if they have any kind of, uh, forget about contemporary analogies. I don't want to make contemporary analogy. Another aspect of significance in Angkor Singh, we're talking about archaic times, is that one of the reasons we don't know about the origin of language is because there's nothing about language that is fossilized. Much of our knowledge of what I'm talking about is based on fossilization, and stone fossilizes much longer than wood. The empty space where the king of Angkor Wat or the emperor of Angkor Wat sat is now a blank space because wood has deteriorated faster than stone. Um, measuring the stars. All the Babylonian cities had the archive in the in the celestial system. The city of Sipara was marked after the cancer. The city of Nineveh was marked after Ursa Major. The city of Asur after Arcturus. I've already mentioned the creation of the city of celestial city Jerusalem was created by God before the city was built by the man, hand of man. St. Augustine found three versions of Jerusalem, sometimes referring to the earthly Jerusalem, sometimes to the heavenly, sometimes to both at once. St. John, oh, forget about St. John, he had an extraordinary, the size of Jerusalem was about 1,500 miles long, about half the area of the United States. So much for believing the disciples. Uh, 
There's a book called The History of Heaven, which is an interesting little book. Um, it discusses how contrived the notion of heaven actually is, uh, and how as, as the monotheistic religions <coughs> became stronger as Christianity took over from Judaism and Islam took over from Christianity. Islam occurs a millennium of 700 years after Christianity. The Quran has much more attention paid to it to ecclesiastical circumstances, to post-living circumstances. You could almost understand in the Quran as when I read it, how joyous it would be to be in afterlife than in secular life. Uh, this notion of privileging the afterlife was, of course, criticized by Marx as one of his many critiques of religion, that, it, that there's nothing natural about making humankind suffer through the abuses of mankind in return for which you have promise of an ecclesiastical benefit. Uh, um, I just want to rush through these so we have time. Fixing places. In the Feng Shui system, there are ways in which you can find a site for a town. The tradition of divining, <coughs> dowsing, geomancy, astrobiology were all primitive methods, you want to call them pseudosciences, for determining a place. A place is not to be taken by a developer as a site for an old age community. A place is uh, one which has sacred significance in this model. The center of the earth, the axis mundi, is the center of all the centers. <coughs> it is a, an accommodation of the cosmic model through a number of, in the, in the Hebrew, in the Jewish religion, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is the site of Adam. Then it is the site of Isaac, <coughs> Abram and Isaac's offering to God and the God's willingness to stop Isaac from Abram from sacrificing Isaac. All of this is sedimented into the Jewish religion. The Temple Mount both Solomon's temple and Herod's temple are burnt on the Temple Mount, making this not the center not only of Judaism but of the world. And Judaism was arrogant enough that until the birth of Christ it was the center of the world. Christianity, for reasons which I'll go into in the history of Jerusalem, in the case study of Jerusalem, didn't abide by that. For 500 years, the Temple Mount was a dump of Roman ruins. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built to turn away from the Temple Mount. When the first Islam, members of Islam came into Jerusalem and they, they wanted to choose a site for their own religious place, they chose the Temple Mount, not the Christian sites. The Christians finally turned to, uh, to too much of a detail. I'd have to draw it to make it more sensible. Um, why, why do they choose a Jewish site? Uh, because they, be, because they, they claim to have many of the same religious heritage, Abram, many of the religious gods. Jerusalem was always considered the second or third largest most significant in the Fada'i literature uh, which celebrates cities. Uh, Jerusalem, after all, the mythology of, uh, of, 
of the ascent from the Dome of the Rock to heaven is important mythology in Islam. The Dome of the Rock is one of the most significant buildings in Islam. It's on the Temple Mount. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is on the Temple Mount. There's a continuity of even violently differing religious forms, accepting an axis mundi. There's an economy of religious sites. You're not terribly, you, if you're not sure about your God, maybe the fact that a previous God sanctified a place, it's like buying it to a firm that has a good economic record, even if you in competition with the, with the firm itself. I don't know, we'd have to get into, when we do the case study in Jerusalem, and I can talk about it in more detail, why we can talk about There's only one place in Jerusalem where all three religions are represented vertically. It's the Christian, Islam, Jewish, the Tomb of David, the, the Christian Last Supper, and the Islam, Ottoman, manifestation above it. <coughs> I'll go into that with diagrams and show. How are we doing? Okay, we've got a few moments. Another aspect of this kind of city is the definition of boundaries. Boundaries and ritual perambulation. The celebration of the king of kingdom of Phnom Penh involved people circulating around the town. Joshua and Jericho, the circuit of the white walls of Memphis for each new coronation of a pharaoh. The Jewish synagogue, where you perambulate around the central, uh, not the Torah, but the central locus from where the prayer is read, is a perambulation. Romulus in the circular rampart traced by the plough to ensure the safety of Rome. The Roman mundus, the meeting of the earth and the lowland regions, has a... The laws of the Indies, which built much of Central America and St. Augustine in Florida, all the way to Los Angeles, uh, says that the, the settlement should have a stockade, even though there was no fear of military action from the residents. The, the idea of marking where your world begins and ends is significant. We have a problem about cities now which dribble into some other form than what architects consider to be the central site of a city. Uh, the bimodal or the bi... I don't know if it's exactly bimodal, it's not bimodal. It's the bi... It's the concept of having more than one allegiance which is baffling. Cities are always, as I because I quoted Marx last class. Cities presume a difference between the country and the city. city. That as long as that mark was clear and understood through walls, everybody was happy. Once the city expanded beyond the walls, uh, we have been left in doubt. This model made no place for doubt. Axis Mundi, the center, is circumvented by a form. There's another pretty curious example of this kind of... In Dorset, in England, there are stone mounds which form, if seen from the air, form giant forms. In southern Peru, the Nazca and the Nasdaq lines are huge conglomerates of huge spiders, identical 
these spires, these lines up to 900 feet long. In Glastonbury in England, there's a planos planospheric circle 10 miles in diameter. It is a Gemini figure made up of field forms. These are unexplained natural devices which must have in some ways had to do with uh, with a system of cosmic identity. The geometry of the land. The Ge Romans, despite their great rationality, used a system of augury to find the right place in the countryside from which the survey could begin. They ended up with the Decumanus Maximus being the east-west and the Decum and the Cardo Maximus being the north-south axis of a town. This directional cardinality occurs in a number of places. The Kaaba has, is depicted with four quarters and diagonal lines running to the corners north, east, west, south. The Union Jack is a, pla is a flag of the same plan. <coughs> Not only does it symbolize the center of the Axis Mundi, but it depicts things that you get the Cartier in France as a part of the city. You get the notion of the headquarters. What is the headquarters? It's an Axis Mundi in military terms. Um, I'm tempted to, in this case, just do a drawing. This is an early symbolic map of Mexico City. The Aztec leader's name is Tinoc. He's depicted as next to an eagle landing on the water with four streams, of course, suggesting a connection outwards to the rest of the world. I choose this as an example of this kind of figure. I choose it for another interesting, silly reason. What is the name of the first city in the Bible, in the Christian Jewish Bible. Enoch. Why do you know it? Uh, it's uh, uh, Cain's son. Yes. And then it's that name minus the tree. Why do you think there's a conjunction in the name? I neither. I haven't the faintest idea either. <laughs> um, the first city in the Bible is curiously called Enoch. What is Enoch? It's the name of Cain's son. Adam's, height in, Adam's hut in paradise, Joseph Rickford's book, presumes that per paradise was perfection. There was no need for shelter. There's no need for architecture in paradise. We've changed that view, of course. Architecture is important for everything. Uh, Cain is banished from paradise. He's a murderer. He murders his brother. He forms the first city. The first city is of crooks, murderers. The first community, urban community in the Bible is a community of retrogrades, people who've been expelled from paradise. The Christian view of this is that there must be something extraordinary about the city and goes into the question of salvation and so on and so on, which I don't understand. But Enoch is the name of the town. The whole idea, Kevin Lynch was always fascinated by the idea of why people name towns after their children. 
and he had a kind of convoluted theory, which I can't remember, as to why that occurs. But here, Enoch is the first city in the Judeo-Christian enterprise, a city of evil, although it's been sanctified in other ways. This is Tenochtitlan. Having a similar, similar kind of reach out, an axis mundi, where the most important thing takes place. The eagle is a symbol of some kind in any case. The leader is next to the eagle. It, it lands on the water. It, the site is a lake. The cactus, for some reason or other, is the permanent, prodigious natural form. Do you know anything about cactus? <laughs> I've never been able to explain the cactus anyway. The second last of these items is the consciousness of place. Yeah, I haven't got time to go into this phenomenon except to tell the story of Levi Strauss's telling in Tris Tropique. Levi Strauss studies the Bororo. The Bororo are a primitive group of people in the Mato Grosso in Brazil. Much like the Dogon in Africa, they are a kind of naive people. The Dogon do wonderful sculpture and put their sculpture often in places for their for posterity. Uh, Bororo is a system in which the town is, or the village is circular. Each place has a particular identity. And what are called moities, those are belief systems, are related to the place that you occupy. When the, when the Silesian missionaries came to missionize the Bororo, they replaced their circular locations with rectangular constructions. The, the Bororo lost their, not only their sense of place, but their sense of identity. So bound in to the existence, their psychic existence, was their position in place. We have elements of it today in our religious life, those of you who have religious lives. Uh, the position of place in front of the altar, in relation in front of the cross, the carrying of the cross and so on, all taken over from this, there's a story in South African history of the famous battle between the Zulus and the Afrikaners in Natal, in which the versions of history are very different. <coughs> the Zulus claim that the white settlers tried to get into the women's quarters which are highly separate identities in a circular system. The, the Afrikaners claim that the, the white people were attracted to the center of this town and were then killed, uh, leading to the famous Battle of Blood River and so on and so on. Numerology, which I won't go into, if you read the cosmology of Chinese cities, um, we should have enough. The five, the nine square system figures 
adding up vertically and horizontally to the number 15. I'm throwing out you, at you a lot of little stories, fragments. There's no coherent overall text on what we've tried, what I've tried to describe. Uh, as for what it means today, it's up to you to, or up to us to make sense of this. We still have people standing before judges. We still have a significance in height. Uh, why build a Tower of Babel 300 feet high? Uh, why build it the, the Temple of the Moon? It's the Temple of the Moon uh, in Tenochtitlan on the Street of the Dead to the same height and put the priests on the top. Um, there are many fragments of this which make up an idea of a kind of city which is no longer prevalent in our thing, but still remains. To the extent that I said, when I said in the last class, that we cannot, under Darwinian science, explain phenomena such as consciousness uh, or mind, uh, quoting from a recent book called Cosmos of Mind, which is a critique of Darwinian science. Uh, architects more than planners, by and large, have a sense of the innate importance of experience and believe through working at it and everyday observation and studying things, you can approximate good solutions. Whether a street in Fifth Avenue in Manhattan has cosmic significance, I don't know. Whether the Macy Parade adds to that significance, I don't know. I certainly know that the parade in Madurai is different from the Macy's parade. This Macy's parade is not a godly phenomenon. It's an experienced phenomenon. As we go on with, in this class, I'll be fussing around with this, pro with this epistemological problem. How much is assumed in our construction of the form of cities? in the rational system which we've learned since the Enlightenment. To what extent do we consciously, or how much do we attempt to maintain an interest, an external or uh, explicit interest in symbolic form? Symbolic form is is a powerful measure of the success of this generation of cities. There's no question, but all the evidence suggests that our cities start with a consciousness and expression of religious form. The rest are stories. You have to believe me. No reason to. Let's look at some pictures. This is Kevin Lynch's depiction of the sites of cities that we're talking about. Mesoamerica around about 1100 BC, 700 BC, Egypt 3005, well, 3500 BC, uh, Jericho 8000, Sumer 4000, Indus 25, Chang China about 1700 BC. Next. Okay. This is a, a painting of the town of Satalyuk, which Jane Jacobs claims to be in a center for the production of obsidian and used the agricultural area around it as servicing the industri industrial function. The curious thing about another depiction which is on the other slide 
is that there's hardly any public space at all. These are obviously alleys from one set, one group of houses to another. Any questions? What's the name Satal Huyuk. C A T A L H U Y U K. It's in Anatolia. Um, I don't know whether it's in Iraq or Turkey. It's in Turkey. It's in Turkey. Satal Huyuk is Turkish, isn't it? There, there is a book by Bill Bryson called At Home where he talks about this city and how peculiar are the entrances and exits between buildings. Yeah. How, how is that reflected in the map? I'm trying to I don't know. The map, these maps, like the first, the map in uh, just outside Amman, the first map of Jerusalem, uh, are very abstract depictions. Uh, this is a wall painting. Okay. And... Uh, the other one is an abstraction. I would place very little faith in the observations of these towns. Uh, archaeology is safer, and the, I don't know how much archaeological investigation has been done at Sotolyuk. That's what he talked about being no space in between. Yeah. I've. I don't think that J it's Jane Jacobs, but somebody has spoken about the roofs as being planes of utility. Uh, I don't think there's much to be gained. It looks like a cont contemporary drawing for a squatter settlement. Next. Returning to a particular place. Benares is on the left, Kaaba on the right, an annual pilgrimage a everyday pilgrimage. Next. Satalyuk. The notion that the water is a, the a replication of the ocean and the vertical building, uh, the uh, depiction of a mountain. Mircea Eliade often talks about mountains and cities as being similar in this kind of ecocosmic model. Um, next. One of the reasons for the towers is because there's no, the, the People had no capacity to span any large distance, so the distances are very small. Uh, uh, here is a parade of stone figures on a sports field, whereas just behind this, the royal palace doesn't exist anymore because it's built out of wood. Next. The phenomenon, and this is the, this is Chichen Itza. Next. Chichen Itza. Masada, one of Herod's <coughs> vacation homes built on the side of the hill. Uh, again, the notion of building on top of something. The Romans finally conquered Masada by building a, a earth bridge to the top. Next. A depiction of the Babylon Tower with a not a very good one. And the mixture of astronomy and religion in the case of the of Tenochtitlan Equinox sunrise over the Temple of Mayor. Next. Here's the city of the Dipper. The constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor superimposed in the plan of Han Dynasty Shang'an. The popular belief of subsequent generations that the city was constantly designed to this pattern is unsupported by any independent evidence. New, nor do the positions of the imperial palaces coincide with that of the pole star, as was, and so on, so. 
be some doubt about this, but it's a nice drawing. Next. The Astronomical Observatory in Chichen Itza. A, a temple town in southern India. Now in uh, each of these vertical constructions is not an astronomical tower. But there's a regularity of the vertical phenomenon throughout the town depicting something or other. Next. Uh, and, uh, a gnomon, a tool used by the Romans for finding a propitious site, and the geomancer's astrobiological instrument for choosing the right site. Next. Chinchirli in uh, Anatolia. Interesting, the first town settlement is fortified with a wall that is small, that surrounds the town as intimately as possible. When the town is economically successful, it builds itself in the first century before Christ, a surrounding wall which is based on a superior geometry, uh, a perfect geometry, a geometry which can be m associated with centrality, with uh, permanent symbolic enclosure of high order and so on. Here the town of Quartzim in the first century BC uh, in southern, uh, it used to be in the south of the USSR, I don't know where it is now. Uh, which has an astronomical center, uh, an astronomical observation site in the center, and the town follows the pattern as it, ex as it moves outwards. Next. The town of Edfu on the Nile, uh, Acudia, marvelous, conjunction of light and shadow uh, in uh, the marking of a special place. Uh, Edfu is the town. It's a small town on the banks of the town. But you have replications of this in, the, in Luxor and in Karnak and so on. Um, I chose, chose that one because it's I happened to photograph it myself, and I was still struck by the conjunction of the positive light and the form of the towers. Um, here's a typical perfect Chinese town. The head of the emperor is in position number one. There are subsequent positions in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, but the town is symmetrically divided between right and left. There's a color for the right, there's a color for the left. Uh, this is a town which is perfectly controlled. And its form is a pristine object for s depicting symbolic security and actual security. Next. Jerusalem is the head of the three continents, the Temple Mount, which I will describe in much greater detail as we go on in this class next. Oh, we've gone out again. How do you, those are formations seen from the sky in Glastonbury in Dorset. Next. The map of Mexico City, and the actual first settlement, next. The, 
the Moati town of the Bororo, the, clan, the position of the clan system, and Moati A and Moati B, specifying the significance of place. Place is not arbitrary. Place is connected to fundamental existence, and here in the in a town in Cameroon, you have a similar depict disposition of man, wife, man, 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 wife, 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 and so on. Not to be mixed up. No cohabitation. Next. The depiction of place, this is the gate of heavenly peace, the marker of the distinction between the whole heavenly city and the secular city, marked here by a recent, more recent uh, emperor. And here the location of the mausoleum to tomorrow on Tiananmen Square, bereft of any disposition of location which is fundamentally wed into the system of the town. <coughs> it is anywhere. It looks as if it could be anywhere and it doesn't... The strength of that pattern on the left is infinitely larger than the strength of the pattern. The, the, the construction of the right is not wed, is not bred into the identity, large identity of the city. Next. It could be anywhere. Uh, let's just pass this. This is the Feng Shui problem. Next. Depictions of the system of approach to the central imp imp imperial position in the city. Here yeah, the whole idea of a set of boxes revealing more as you go into the system. Next. The mandala, the central premise of the Indian system. Uh, a depiction of the body of the Brahma uh, in a system of subdivision of land. Here, the Hindu religion has a number of texts about this, uh, the sighting of place, the South Sopa Sistra. Uh, here you see uh, some depictions of the way in which the basic ma Mandala system can be demarcated next. Let's take one of them. The village Dandaka is appropriate for retired life. The village has a one, two, five parallel streets from east to west. Can you imagine us living in a system where we control our environment so religiously that the developer in Florida would be told to build a religious center on this basis of a mandala construction. It's beyond our belief system. Uh, next. Jaipur, next. And Madurai. The rituals performed regularly throughout the year conforming to the town's structure. So that when you are performing a ritual, it is territorial, you're passing through territory. Number two, it is reinforcing your notion of the plan of the town. What do we do today to reinforce your understanding of the plan of Boston? It's unnecessary. Maybe if you're driving a car and you move along the river, there's some sensibility about the movement from the suburb to the center of the city. Next, the Street of the Dead.
Here's the vacant geometry of the of a typical settlement in the Mayan world. Uh, the apparent lack of axial relationships, the, vac the so-called vacant city, because there's really, very little evidence of where people lived. Again, what is left are elements of stone construction, monuments. Uh, I think that's a lot. On Tuesday, we will look at um, examples of a highly com or a completely different formal system, one which is open-ended, loose, not regulated by central force. So, have a good weekend.